so we had a very fast conversation on uh, cool leaving and um, and now but now we are actually having a little bit more time to talk about the future of work and I have to, to today with me two people with very different experiences around the same topic so Boyd um, comes from he has been researching and doing a lot of work around uh, the future of work about basic income about entrepreneurship in cities and civic entrepreneurship and um, we have Pedro Jardim that uh, is the founder of Recommend and also Colliga um, and and basically Pedro is uh, leaving or making sure that uh, we can all leave uh, the future of work today. But I would like to talk, uh, to start with Boyd um, around like in the, you, you recently wrote a book um, uh, or uh, basically about po the post-capitalism entrepreneurship, and I would like to un understand from you what like what have you been seeing that leads people to have completely different or build comp completely different companies from the past and uh, so what's happening in the uh, in our capitalism uh, capitalistic world hi thanks for having me uh yeah that's a big question right uh capitalism uh, what's wrong with it uh, a lot uh, and i have a phd in business so uh, and i'm a director of research at a business school so uh, I'm not a normal person uh, saying these things that I'm about to say, but I believe capitalism has basically run its course, at least in its capability of achieving uh, any kind of common collective benefit for society, that what we've seen um, are at least three fundamental failures of capitalism. One is um, the, the absolutely poor distribution of, of wealth, so it's increasingly uh, in the hands of fewer. Probably many of you have seen the reports over the last couple of years from Oxfam. I, I mean, I was shocked the first year I saw when it said something like 360 of the wealthiest people in the world had the same wealth of the 50% lowest income people in the world. And the next year it was like 100 and something. The next year was 80. The next year was 8, which was last year. And this year it's 5, I believe. So we're heading towards, in the next couple of years, the the wealth of one person accumulated in one month will be equal to the wealth of 50% of the population. And soon after that, it'll be the wealth of one person one month equal to 99% of the population's wealth. And then it'll, you see where we're going. So, terrible distribution of wealth. Apple has $250 billion in cash reserves. Um, you know, Trump, I'm from the US, uh, but don't blame me for Trump. I definitely didn't vote for him. Um, you know, he, as part of his campaign, made this big, uh, uh, claim about how we need to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. And he kept bringing out Apple as an example. Well, it's funny that he focuses on Apple because you look at what is Apple doing. Right now they produce most of their, work, their products in, in China with Foxconn. Last year, Foxconn automated one factory and 65,000 people lost their jobs. So if in China the cost of labor is too high for Apple's contractor to produce so much so that it justifies a massive investment in automation of their factory, what is an Apple factory going to look like in the U.S. if they were to build one? One manager using one iPad running the entire uh, factory. So no jobs will be created. So we have a problem with uh, lack of distribution of wealth. Uh, we have um, a problem with jobs. So uh, until the 1980s, we had almost perfect correlation between um, efficiency of corporations, so labor efficiency, jobs, and uh, income growth per capita until around the 1980s. Uh, some people refer to this now as the great decoupling. Around the time the internet came out, we started seeing separations, and it's getting worse. So what are we seeing? Impro improved efficiency of corporate uh, activity, so they're more profitable with fewer resources, but we're seeing a, a, st a stabilizing and a declining um, job growth and um, uh, income uh, distribution. So it's not creating, capitalism is not creating jobs anymore, it's not uh, creating collective wealth for society, uh, and it's mostly creating wealth for wealthy. So we have a problem now. Uh, you know, that's the negative side. But what we're seeing is uh, entrepreneurs and governments, particularly local governments, cities, sort of rallying around alternative models of organizing that say, you know what? Yeah, the traditional capitalist model is not really working for us, but um, 
we can organize in different ways to create value in different ways and, ex and, and exchange that value in different ways than what a traditional capitalist enterprise would do. And increasingly, uh, which I wrote about in my last book on, on the emergence of the urban entrepreneur, the democratization of innovation technology is fascinating. You know, the accessibility of servers in the cloud and access to open source software and fab labs and co-living spaces and co-working spaces and all this stuff is facilitating access to innovation and technology uh, to more people living, especially in cities, in ways that allow them to not necessarily need a traditional venture capital and go through a traditional startup process. So we're seeing all kinds of cool alternative organizing, and I'm sure we'll get into that as we keep uh, the discussion going. Yeah, I think exactly. I would like to go into that. It's like you, what kind of examples are you seeing from new ways of building companies, new ways of organizing uh, people around a specific goal? What are the most exciting things that you are seeing? Yeah, I mean, so in my my new book, which come, well, I'm I'm really hot. I never go anywhere without my hat, but I'm just too hot, so it's it's off. Uh, so, uh, in my new book, uh, Post Capitalist Entrepreneurship, comes out in September. Uh, I talk about a bunch of different types of organizing we're finding that have emerged over the last uh, several years that are growing in in strength and really fascinating. So we have um, I have a whole chapter on commons-based peer production. That's what I just heard in the last session, the discussion about commons as well. So there are people who are trying to figure out how can we, well, we all know about the open software movement, for example. That's an example of people are contributing to a commons because they're not expecting any uh, monetary gain for their contribu their intellectual contribution to something that is for the greater good. Uh, in Barcelona, I had a chance to meet with an entrepreneur who's actually from France, but living in Barcelona with his colleague that created this company called Aqua Pioneers. Very cool. They're actually in the middle of a crowdfunding campaign right now. They have this autonomous, self-enclosed, uh, local, you can put it in your house, um, f um, device that allows you to um, create produce for your home, in your home, no matter where you live in the world, self-contained. Has a fish tank, the fish poo, their poo goes into fertilizing the, the plants, plants grow, um, the water for the fish tank gets cycled through the plants to filter out and go back into the fish. And it's a closed loop and it's a 3D printed model. They did it in a fab lab in, in Barcelona and they're committed to the commons so they're actually creating, they're making their software code accessible so that anyone at any fab lab anywhere in the world could print out one of these things and be able to produce some of their own uh, produce in their own house. But yet they're still struggling with and trying to figure out what's the right revenue model, business model, if they're giving away their core expertise to the commons. And he and I had a long conversation. In fact, in my book, I write like six ideas we came up with on other ways you could generate revenue. And this is a fascinating part of the this post-capitalism world is that increasingly there's so many people interested in contributing to the greater good, to the commons, and they're not driven to become the next Zuckerberg and make multi-billions. They do want to make a living, though. So how do you make a living and contribute to the commons is something that we're still working on around the world, figuring out cool models for. So that's just one example. That's commons-based peer production. Everyone's probably heard of B Corps. It's a, it's a type of startup or established company that legally commits themselves to meet social and environmental objectives. I have a chapter on that. Now, I, I don't really consider them post-capitalist. There's a lot of them. There's over a 1,000 around the world. They're still operating in a capitalist society and a capitalist model. However, what's different about them is that they are legally requiring themselves to meet these social and sustainability objectives so that... Um, they can't have outside investors that try to force them to go down the traditional capitalist route of, of maximizing short-term profits. Uh, we have platform co-ops, which we hear a lot about at the WeShare. Um, Stocksy is one of my favorite ones. They're based in Victoria, Canada. A bunch of artists um, uh, created a platform for sort of co-ownership of the um, provision and sale of access to um, um, materials like photos and videos that, that professional and, and um, amateur photographers take. Uh, and they share like 50% of the profits with the photographer. So it's a, it's a cooperative model, but at a platform scale. We have blockchain-enabled distributed autonomous organizations. Some of you may have heard of Open Bazaar. Is an early example of some organization trying to play in that space. What they're trying to be is like an eBay without eBay in the middle. 
That's what DAOs are, actually distributed autonomous organizations are blockchain enabled organizations that have no company. They're not an operating entity. It's basically open source software community created to facilitate the exchange of stuff between people without anyone in the middle monetizing the transaction. So Open Bazaar is a cool example, and there's a lot of people working in the DAO space. And then that leads to all the alternative currency movement. Now, some of the alternative currency movement is speculation and sort of same old, same old banks and everybody else playing. But there's something cool happening, too, in the alternative currency space uh, where we're seeing alternative organizing at the local level. In Barcelona, we're experimenting with something. Uh, with basic income, where a percentage of the recipients of a basic income experiment are going to get a digital social currency, and that digital currency could actually be enhanced not through traditional financial exchange, but say I choose to, I don't know, volunteer to clean a park one day. The city can choose to give, give me uh, social currency addition to my account in my, my phone for contributing to the community. We think about the maker community, which we have a very vibrant one in Barcelona, and I know there's a lot of discussion around maker communities here, and, and we share. Uh, a lot of the maker communities are struggling with this thing about how can they survive without giving in to corporate agenda and raising funding and becoming a traditional company. They just want to make stuff for themselves or for their friends. And you think about, well, what if a city could offer um, uh, digital social currency credit for um, you offering as a maker uh, workshops for students, for children who want to learn how to make stuff uh, in uh, clothing or out of used furniture or whatever that is. Uh, and then if you see where this is going, we could actually at the ground up, gra grassroots, create an alternative local economy that is interconnected globally. So my Aquapioneers guy can send his digital file for his aquaponic solution to anyone in Brazil or anyone who wants to print it anywhere in the world without any material having to travel across the world and the climate effects of that. Um, it's empowering people around the world to actually have access to things they wouldn't normally be able to access and is changing the paradigm of our economy in pretty profound ways. And we're seeing around the world all kinds of cool examples like that. Thank you. Pedro, how does uh, rec recommend actually fits into this post-capitalist world? And especially around like building um, demand and supply uh, for, for, for a new way of living. Uh, um Thank you very much. I guess I guess uh, there are two two things here that we have to differentiate because what you're talking about uh, has a lots of vision and has a lots of uh, it's already looking into a future that um, might require some some major paradigm shifts and I really think those ideas are are super exciting and I think we are getting there. But I guess we building tools for a transitional phase, uh, we still, I still question where, what are the incentivization systems that you actually have to put into place for, for, thing, for people to actually get involved into a large scale of things. And I guess I've, we've been experimenting with, with those incentivization systems and I question, and this is part of uh, what I think that dialogue could go in an interesting direction is, are people actually ready for an incentivation system that is reflecting some commons? Uh, or do people still need this sort of uh, an incentivation system that creates uh, a, a way for them to differentiate themselves uh, within the realm? Uh, is there, is there, is there a, this is a question for me, and I guess just to, to elaborate on your question specifically, so we've been experimenting with a few things over the last years. Uh, one of the things was a co-working space that we started in Berlin, the other one was a cleaning service where we built a software for the cleaners to self-organize around the incoming jobs, and then once we got into Coliga, we were thinking about co-working spaces and all those communities and seeing, okay, could those communities also act as an uh, agent for local talent because they know they have so much insights into into their talent and how could how could we create a business model for them there and experimenting there we 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 figure out that one of the major things also for for the professionals and for the people in this transition space in this transition realm where not everything yet is 
working on the logic of a commons or uh, it is uh, very important that people need to get more job opportunities that actually pay their rent right uh, or pay whatever they need to to live in actual euros or whatever the currency of the place is and what we figure out is uh, basically one of the very interesting points uh, uh, for people is uh, once um, i am interacting with you professionally one of the most uh, valuable things for you is uh, that I can uh, recommend you, that I can say, okay, you've done a great job. And uh, we see this in platforms such as LinkedIn or the other platforms. But what we figure out is like, how can we create a way for every client that somebody has to share these recommendations with their friends and uh, what, what is the power that is not just in the community itself but what is the power of the extended network meaning uh, if i go out there i might have uh, i have uh, 3500 friends on facebook but that's not the average the average person has 300 friends on facebook i'm not saying that i'm somehow special for that but the question is from these 300 friends those people have so many other f connections and how can we go this extra level and understand what the possibilities of interactions are based on this qualitative curation. And that's something that we've been experimenting with and uh, it is very interesting because people want to go and book a professional, they don't, they are not, so many people are tired of this idea of going somewhere and uh, looking through thousands of profiles and comparing them as if they were products but one, if you add a qualitative layer to it, and you say, you're not gonna see thousands of profiles, but you're gonna see maybe 150 profiles who, which are connected to the people that are already your friends, or who, and who friends of your friends have already recommended, so, so suddenly you have a very, very different way of approaching that. And this is a bit of, uh, of the uh, tra tra trajectory that we've took from, okay, seeing the communities as, 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 as agents for local talent and also now looking into how can we create a very simple way for people to legitimate each other and, and create more economic opportunities to each other through spreading that to their friends. It's very interesting because I remember when I, when we first talked and I started like hearing more about Colliga and recommend, and, and I was so excited to see that first you were moving away from this idea that social networks allow us to get everywhere in any time because I think that was the promise of social networks when they like Facebook and LinkedIn and, and Twitter like everyone is available here, but we could not actually understand that. It, 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 it's available, it's true, but it's at a cost and we, it's very hard for us as individuals to know everyone in our communities and be able to tap into the skills of everyone. But also, um, the, the fact, for example, I, I personally end up like talking with a lot of people um, and uh, have a lot of people ask me for recommendations of people that are like the iOS developer or the design thinker or, and I got a lot of a request from people and it's very hard for me sometimes to know exactly who in my community is actually doing what. So what you're trying to do with Recommend and, and Colleague is actually allow people to do that at scale. So from allowing me as an individual and as an informal connector to be able to tap into my network when, uh, and create job opportunities for my network in a way that before was not possible. Is that the, the case? Yes, exactly. And really tapping into into this idea that uh, yeah, this, this this qualitative network has actually much more value if or much more value would be there is a, a, a different type of value there that people are much more willing to 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 look for because because they don't want to be firstly treated as a product or treated as a commodity, and so this idea of of, of adding as this filtering layer really. Um, changes a lot uh, on the perception on on the on the interaction feel but going back to the communities because actually the topic of our our um, our conversations about like how communities are actually um, uh, helping define the future of work you are uh, in some sense a community builder as well you have been building communities uh, for the past few years with your co-working space and now with the with, with uh, this uh, this new uh, company like 
how do you see, like, how can we harness the power of communities in a way that, because I, I believe that companies are becoming communities as well. Um, we are always all part of different communities that we interact on a daily basis in different ways. How can we actually em empower communities more um, to, to be able to position them, uh, themselves better in the future of work? Oh, that's a great question. You can also contribute to that. I think I think the idea of community. I mean, the idea of bringing people together uh, is uh, that are not necessarily having a function and necessarily having to fulfill a protocol idea of how they should interact with a legal entity. This is a very old idea, but right now with like all those technologies that we've had over the last years, we've we have that happening. In, in larger scale, and we've seen also on the opening speech from, from Pia, the idea that uh, they are doing with Open Collective, which is exactly giving, giving this first step a possibility for, for communities to organize. And I, guess, and I guess, coming to your question, I guess that's, that the boundaries between companies and communities is kind of changing because companies are also needing to adapt to the reality that the best working force may, might not want to be hired full time in, and come from Monday to Friday into this particular office. So you might have to adapt to getting people in a different ways. So you, you have automatically different challenges on how to stay in touch with these people, how to connect them. And I mean, uh, we are, I, I think we share is a great example of how this can be successfully managed. And so, what are the trends that we are seeing there? Because Boyd also talked about like people now want different things. They don't want necessarily to build the next Facebook, but they want to build. They want to, of course, make money, but they want to build something that impactful. Are you seeing that uh, in the people that you, you interact with, both in Agora and uh, Recommend? I mean, there is, <laughs> there is, there is this idea of uh, what happens on the ground on the community base, and there is a lot of change there. But definitely, the the, the scale of this change happens with uh, different people all over the world doing different things. But I think the most exciting things that we are seeing in the direction of of change and scale change is the the idea of protocols, right? I think like with the idea of blockchain, we are going to a realm where somehow and that's i think there is a very good uh, uh, connecting point i think the idea of blockchain is an idea that it's kind of opening a realm of enormous possibilities for the future of work where at the same time uh, we have some old financial incentivation systems that allow a lot of liquidity to come into a system where the people that are engaging with that might have a financial upside as well, which fosters the development of uh, infrastructure and technology to that. And, and that's really amazing, and that happened in the beginning of the internet. But I think what is really, really interesting with blockchain is that suddenly we are getting into that space uh, where people actually everybody, many people can get rich, and so you get a lot of smart people getting there. Uh, but at the same time, the technology has an inherited nature that conflicts with that, right? Which has a, which opens a whole realm of of discussions, and I think it's quite interesting point. And we will look back in 20 years, and we will see what have we made of it. And I think that's really interesting, specifically for the future of work. Yeah. But you want to give us all our, your thoughts on it? Well, uh, interesting the way what Pedro just did was a transition to a project I'm working on, which I'm not going to advertise because it doesn't have a name yet, and I'm not about self-promotion. But it's it's um, to explain where we could go with this combination of stuff. Uh, I'm early stage working on a project, which would be an ICO, initial coin offering for the platform cooperative community. And the idea would be um, leveraging... Um, Leveraging this capital, that's that the, the liquidity that's in the market in the in the cryptocurrency space right now, getting some of those who are actually committed to the same values all of us are who are here at WeShare, um, to actually commit to and in basically investing in a fund uh, that the ICO initial coin offering would essentially create a fund 
to invest in platform cooperatives because we've heard already a few times um, today that one of the biggest challenges to getting platform cooperatives to scale and to growing around the world is the access to finance and that they're not platform cooperatives are typically not attractive to traditional investors or venture capitalists and they often don't want to go a uh, founder founders of platform cooperatives don't want to work with venture capitalists either frequently so um, they don't they don't work well together because the values are not uh, consistent so we're working on something like that, which goes a bit to your point about how blockchain could be fairly transformational in ways that do empower um, alternative modes of organizing and, and sort of uh, different ways of, of doing business uh, could actually be used, the blockchain could be used to enable the financing of these kinds of projects. So definitely agree with you. I mean, I think, I mean, the financing is definitely a very, very core aspect of it. And uh, over the last, one and a half years, uh, together with uh, some other people, we co-founded the um, uh, fund, which is called Purpose Purpose Fund, which is also looking into investing co into companies that have a different uh, type of ownership. And I guess into the finance part, it's like it's there is there is a really there is a really conflicting and there is a really difficult thing there because if we are looking into this world where things will work in a different paradigm, then that means uh, many other things will have to change. And the incentivization systems that we have around finances are mostly around short-term uh, uh, return. But around blockchain, you, can, you could basically have uh, daily liquidity in whatever investments you do, which opens a huge space for speculation as well. But I don't know. It's a, it's a big topic. I mean, it's a very hot topic. And I really... I'm hopeful about it, and I see there is a lot of idealism in the field, and the people that are doing things, they're really, they're really coming with a lot of idealism, and I'm really, um, I'm really looking forward uh, to see the development of that, because yeah, it is it is this new space that is very interesting. Right in the, I think we were talking before about we are getting into a world where not as many jobs will be available. Basic income can be become a reality. What's like, what do you envision for that world? Like what's going to happen? Um, yeah, the, I recently was having a conversation with a friend of mine saying like, we are going to have to train people for leisure, like for ha to having fun because most people, I think work is such a, an important part of our life that people sometimes actually forget how to have fun and how to have flow in that mo mo moments of fun and, and leisure. So what do you see, what is your vision for the future? You know, in the future that of course we don't know how it's going to be, but where it's expecting, we are expecting to have less shops and ma basic income might be a reality. Yeah, obviously, as you say, it's uh, it's a dangerous task getting into the future prediction business because uh, we can be quoted in all the things we said wrong at WeShare in July of 2017. But um, my my own uh, projections are absolutely there will be fewer jobs the way we know of them, uh, as in you get paid by a singular employer for a salary on a monthly basis. I really think it's hard to imagine anything else but that happening, as in um, a significant decline over time in the availability of jobs, uh, like full-time jobs for people. I think we're going to see a lot more people using platforms like Pedro's to actually get um, contract work and doing multiple projects over periods of time. And it, that's a combination of, of no other alternative to but that anyway, but also um, a, a growing number of people actually prefer that kind of lifestyle than a traditional employed situation anyway. So I think sort of social factor, sociological evolution is, is happening as well. So we'll have fewer full-time jobs. I'm not convinced yet that you know we're all going to be sitting on a beach, although I wish I was in a pool right now. I feel like I'm in one anyway, but uh, I'm not. Um, I don't think, I, I'm not convinced that the future is universal basic income and the majority of people basically not doing anything that we would kind of consider as work. I think we're going to see a massive um, evolution of what we think work is. We define work today as you work for a company and you get a paycheck. But what is it? What is that when you're a maker, and I ta the maker I talked about, who's passionate about um, taking old furniture and making them into new things? 
If that person does that for a living somehow and also teaches children who come once a week to learn how to do it, is that work? Does a maker think it's work? Is he getting, he or she getting paid a salary for that? Is anyone even paying him traditional or her euros for it? Maybe they're getting alternative currency, social, digital, I don't know. What is, what is it called when you actually have the flexibility to take care of your sick child or your, your grandparent because you actually have more flexibility because you don't have a nine to six job Monday to Friday? Is that work? Probably not, at least not the way we think of it. Do you get paid to do it? No. Is it an hourly wage? No. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm not, I am convinced there's not going to be full-time work for many people in the future, and myself included could be automated out of work. I saw last year an article in Japan about a, a group of AI programmers who programmed uh, a computer to actually develop its own, programmed a software tool to actually develop short stories. And they submitted the short story to a, 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 a writer's competition in Japan, and it made it to the finals of this competition with a panel of five expert um, literary gurus of Japan. So I do a lot of writing. So, you know, AI, can be, computers can be trained to do my work too. Um, so I think, I, I, I think automation is coming, and, and big data, automation, uh, robotics, all these things are going to affect a lot of people's jobs. Uh, at all levels of the economic spectrum, but I don't think we're actually headed for a future 20 years from now where we're all just trying to figure out what to do with our, our, our newly found 60 hours of nothing to do. I, I, I feel like we're going to have like a parallel society too. We're going to have still people will be working at the apples and whatever the world if they're still around, right? So there'll still be people working in multinational companies, but way fewer. The, the multinational companies will still exist, but again, they'll be, I, I think we're heading towards, you know, Google and Amazon owning half of the world at this point. Um, but then I think we're going to have all this interesting, um, hyper-local, community-level economic activity that is interconnected globally. So this uh, maker communities that can upload their designs and can be printed anywhere in the world and therefore we reduce or eliminate the need for transportation from China. I think we're going to see this kind of parallel thing happening. There's going to be fewer people working in full-time jobs. There's going to be a percentage of people doing contract work and um, kind of finding work along the way but in short-term intervals and then taking vacations when they want and being digital nomads and the rest of it. And there's going to be people that are actually quite happily um, doing things locally, either things that would be considered traditionally economic activity like making stuff to sell to their local neighborhoods or doing things like I said in terms of helping family or doing things that we currently don't actually pay for value. So I think we'll see a range of all that. And basic income in some way I think is going to be part of it, but people around the world in basic income are trying to paint basic income with one brush. They're trying to say we either have to have it or we shouldn't have it. And it either has to be unconditional basic income for every person over 18 or it has to be a guaranteed minimum income for people who make a certain level of income or below. I think what we're going to see is a whole blend of all of that, depending on all kinds of things like the, the local country context, the economic context of that country, what kind of jobs are currently available, what are the um, housing prices in those cities where the people are living. And I also think we're going to see more digital currency play a more important role. If you think about right now, one of the big debates about basic income is how to finance it. If you assume I would argue it's a neoliberal assumption that everyone needs traditional cash currency to actually pay for housing, food, and everything else, and it has to be euros or whatever, then we're a little more limited in what kind of things we can do at a national level to give everyone in France a basic income, for example. But what if at least a percentage of basic income was distributed at a local level and, and provided through a social digital currency like we're experimenting with in Barcelona? is no longer required to actually finance 100% of this with the treasury, but maybe 40% and 60% comes from local currency. And any of you who follow the local currency movement know um, what you get with local currency, if it's done right, is a high 
velocity of transactions happening in the local community between local residents and local providers of services. So if you're a Walmart, you're not going to be very happy with a lot of local currency going around because you can't use local currency to buy your inventory from China. But if you're a local retailer, you can actually source your materials locally as well, and it actually um, creates, uh, I think uh, some of the research shows it's like a three times increase for every dollar spent using local currency. It, it um, creates three more dollars of local economic benefit. So I think we're going to see all of that happening, but we'll see. Yeah, I'm trying to get my, my head around that because the question for me is, and, and I like to think that we're going to this direction, uh, but I also uh, tend to uh, sometimes realize that we, we live in a bubble with those ideas, right? We are talking about a very, very small percentage of the population that is exposed to this sort of ideology, ideas, incentivization systems, and narratives about the world. And I think one of the major challenges that I see coming is not, it's in order to, to have a constructive path into the future, is what are, what are the prototypes that are being created here? And what, what, are, what are the ways in which you can uh, in a massive scale, get people to operate in a different way. And I think uh, the, the, the opening speech was very, very interesting because if you look at the, the environment of, of, of the refugee crisis, there is a, there is a sandbox for, for something to happen. I think this, this whole conversation has a, should have a space of its own. And there is also a question if this is not a sort of, if one coming with these ideas, you're not creating a n new type of colonization. But I guess there is, the question is for me, how are we going to create the protocols for people to uh, go out of their idea of, their, of the education system that they have been pushed through, which is, a, which is an education system that is inherited from, from, from very different bases from that, that that don't have anything to do with what we are thinking here, and uh, we are very 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 privileged to be having these conversations. And I I think yeah, planning this transition, planning, and then that's where I think the connection point to communities come in because that's why I guess the prototypes that are happening in communities and maybe the communities are, are going are the places where we are figuring out where actually people will be able to come together and unlearn. What they are, they've, they've done, and I que and I question this unlearning process it, it is going to be very, very, very important because if things start changing rapid, rapidly, you need to process all these people into a new operating system, and in order to transition them, you need spaces, you need knowledge, and you need to. And I'm very, very, very. Uh, uh, I think it, it's it's a, of great concern for me how you're going to be able to do this in a scale that is required for the thing to look constructive at the end. I would like to now open the, the floor to, to questions. I'm not sure if you have any questions. I know everyone is like, it's very hot here. But I think questions can, fresh questions can help. Hi, thank you. Um, I think the fact of having less and less long-term contracts uh, is already a reali reality. And in France, uh, people who don't have these uh, tackle some difficulties. For instance, not uh, being able to access housing. Do you have examples of places or cities or communities where this has been uh, um, solved? Uh, I think this is this is a great question, and uh, many freelancers all over the world have this problem, right? I think just to clarify on this question that there is less people uh, actually having full-time jobs. At least in Germany, that's not the case. So more people are having full, uh, being full, fully employed at this moment. So uh, the, the progression of that is not the is not a reliable uh, assumption that we can take. But 
if we assume in that direction and all the people that are freelancing, they are having uh, m major cases, uh, problems to, to kind of uh, get into a city. And I think uh, coming back to the uh, talk about uh, uh, open collectives, the idea of having a legal structure that, that that is able to aggregate all of those freelancers and, and create some sort of like some sort of like protection is it's a very interesting idea. There is a there is a, an organization that is across uh, Europe uh, in in Germany. It's called Smart. They have six sixty thousand freelancers and they do all the back end for the freelancers and then freelancers can kind of be hired and then you you make it in a way that they invoice it for you and you can and you can optimize how you get hired so you can kind of create some sort of representation in the system but i guess this is a, just a temporary solution until uh, the governments kind of create a, a more yeah a more welcoming structure for this type of lifestyle right specifically real quick on the housing question um, a housing is a is a challenge, the affordability of housing is a challenge in pretty much every city in the world. Uh, and of course, even more of a concern for the people in the precarious position of not having traditional full-time employment. Uh, there are experiments and projects around the world and cities around the world all trying to address af housing affordability in one way or the other. Uh, I often go back to Vancouver because they've done some cool things. I lived in Vancouver for a while and um, Vancouver had a project for the Olympics in 2010 where um, they gave a density bonus to the developers. If they, a density bonus meaning that that land normally would have been authorized for only like four stories of residential buildings and they were building 20 buildings for the athletes village but that were going to be converted to regular residents after very high quality, high end buildings, uh, very green buildings right near the city waterfront. And uh, the city uh, offered like basically the equivalent of like two or three stories more height on every building if they agreed to add 30% affordable housing into the development. And one of the reasons I love that example is because um, what we see in a lot of parts of the world when we look at affordable housing solutions in cities, they often do social housing. They put them as far away from the city as they can, pretty much, which makes them isolated, the people living there, isolated from the economy and the community and the cultural events, and, and basically exacerbates or continues this problem we have with inequality in cities. Um, and so instead of doing that, they said, we'll let you have more bonus uh, to produce, uh, uh, to construct more housing, but you have to add all these social housing units in the same development that people are gonna be spending a million dollars on to live in an apartment in. And a lot of places in the world, when I bring up that example, they're like, oh, that would never work in my country because rich people don't wanna live close to poor people. Um, so it's breaking down paradigms, it's giving uh, affordable housing access to people in places closer to work and, and activity and transportation. Um, so that's an example. Another thing I saw just came out from Vancouver, but it's an issue all these cities in the world are facing, even mine now in Barcelona, is you have property speculators around the world that are actually um, investing in real estate, but actually not planning on uh, renting out the property. They just want, they leave it empty. Like in Barcelona right now, it's, uh, property is appreciating around 8% a year. That's pretty good return. So. You get wealthy people from China and everywhere else in the world, but it's happening, a lot of wealthy Chinese are doing this. They're investing in real estate. In Vancouver, they do it a lot. They invest in, in new construction projects, for example, and will buy six or eight or 10 apartment units in a new construction with no intention of renting it to anybody or occupying it, holding on to it, and then just selling it for the returns they will get in the next three to five to 10 years uh, as the market continues to rise. So they're using it purely as speculative real estate investment. Well, what that does is exacerbate housing problems and affordability. So um, Vancouver just implemented a luxury uh, tax on uh, houses that are purchased and not occupied. And one of the things they're gonna do with that extra revenue they get from the tax is actually um, construct more affordable housing. So there's all kinds of things you can do and cities around the world are exploring what to do with. We heard about co-living as part of it. 
Um, you know, in Barcelona, we have this maker district that's getting some traction, and a lot of the, the people working the maker district don't have a significant monthly income, and we're exploring how do you, how can they actually uh, find housing if, if, let's say we go to social digital currency, how could we turn that currency into something you could use to pay for rent, for example? So is there a way you can do other things for society if you don't have a normal job, get some kind of payment, whether that's traditional payment or alternative digital currency, and convert that currency into something that could be used for things you need, like food and housing? Uh, we don't have the answers to that, but there are, there are challenges. Thank you very much. So the time is up. Uh, Pedro and Boy will stay around here, so feel free to ask them uh, questions after. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much.